on this Saturday night, make or break aid vote. After months of delay, Congress reaches a consensus on foreign aid. The bill is passed. Questions and concerns about where some of the money is going. Amid heightened tensions ahead of Passover in Israel. I'm afraid that no one care anymore. As Indians vote in the world's biggest election, some sick Canadians worry India is interfering in our elections. The record crowd and history-making win kicking off the professional women's hockey league playoffs. While Canadian NHL fans hope fate is on their side for this year's Stanley Cup. It's been over 30 years, but this could be the year a Canadian team can make a run. Global National with Farah Nasser. Good evening to you. Thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with a pivotal vote in the U.S. After months of urgent calls from Ukraine to replenish its military aid, hours ago in a rare Saturday session, Congress finally passed a $95 billion aid package, not only to answer those calls, but to address a slew of global security concerns. Cheers in the House of Representatives after a majority vote to pass $61 billion in aid dedicated to helping Ukraine. Now, that's just one part of a package split into several bills, including $26 billion slated for Israel, most of it in military aid as the crisis in Gaza continues. $9 billion of that will be for humanitarian aid for Gazans. The House also passed more than $8 billion in security aid for the Indo-Pacific region, primarily Taiwan. As Arnitha Garcia reports in our top story tonight, the much-needed help was only approved after months of stalling, driven by political divides in Washington, and it continues to be criticized by hardline Republicans. On this vote, the yeas are 366 and the nays are 58. The bill is passed. With the resounding passage of the $95 billion package, bipartisan efforts to tackle global security concerns are taking center stage. But the commitment to shore up security aid for key players like Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan stirred up a heated debate, with lawmakers plan to split the bills reflecting a tricky dance to quell opposition from all sides. We have a responsibility, not as Democrats or Republicans, but as Americans to do what is necessary to defend democracy wherever it is at risk. The United States taxpayer has already sent $113 billion to Ukraine, and a lot of that money is unaccounted for. President Joe Biden issued a statement highlighting urgency to, quote, quickly send this package to my desk so I can sign it into law and we can quickly send weapons and equipment to Ukraine to meet their urgent battlefield needs. $23 $23 billion is allocated to replenishing U.S. weapon stocks and facilities. The president also highlighting the critical support to Sudan, Haiti and more than $9 billion towards humanitarian assistance in Gaza. But I think the plight that the Palestinian civilians are facing right now, I think that outweighs any concern about whether some of the humanitarian relief might be misused. Former U.S. Ambassador to NATO and Special Representative for Ukraine Kurt Volker emphasizes the importance of collective response efforts among NATO allies. It's important for all of our allies, Canada as well as our European allies, to step up, spend at least 2 percent of GDP on defense. And similar sentiments are being shared in Canada as the president of Poland meets with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau this weekend with discussions around support for Ukraine and underscoring the importance of international cooperation. Nitu Garcha, Global News, Vancouver. As we've been reporting, a major part of the congressional aid package today, $26 billion, is to support Israel in its battle against Hamas and Iran. It's not clear exactly what that money will be spent on, but what is clear is that the war has claimed more than 34,000 lives in Gaza, according to its Hamas-run health ministry. That's on top of the 1,200 Israeli lives killed on October 7th. There are still more than 130 hostages remaining in the Strip, and calls for their return and the swift end to the war keep growing. Crystal Gamansing is in Jerusalem for us tonight. Crystal. Farah, there is an overwhelming sense of desperation at these rallies. People here take to the streets hoping someone will hear their calls 
and rescue their friends and loved ones from Gaza. They're chanting now, now. The demand is as clear as it is urgent. We feel hopeless. We don't know what to do. We are really, really sad and we are coping with lots of losses. 133 hostages remain in Gaza. Benjamin Netanyahu, his cabinet and Israeli military leaders have all talked about the importance of bringing them home. Six months on, it is an unfulfilled promise. So these Israelis pack the street near the prime minister's home, bellowing for action. And I'm afraid that no one cares anymore. And the most important thing, that we bring them home now. Now it's the time. Heightened emotions at a time of regional instability. A base in Iraq, south of Baghdad, was the latest to be hit. It's not clear what happened or who was responsible, but early Saturday morning local time, there was an explosion and fire. One member of Iraq's popular mobilization force was killed and several others injured. The base reportedly housed a pro-Iranian militia. Iran was also hit. Isfahan is a strategic location with a military base and nuclear facilities. A strike widely believed to have been carried out by Israel, although it did not claim responsibility. The two nations have been settling scores as of late with no prospect for a solution. Our first priority should be ending the Israeli occupation and implementing the two-state solution formula, said Turkey's foreign minister. He says that is the only way to calm regional tensions. It is possible that we won't see any more direct strikes between Iran and Israel and that things will revert back to the shadow war between Iranian proxies and Israel. But even if that's what happens, for those in Gaza, it means continued death and destruction. Farah? Thanks, Crystal. And really, nowhere is more dangerous than in Gaza, where both residents and aid workers are vulnerable. And tonight we're learning of another attack on those trying to deliver emergency help. This water truck belonging to an aid organization from Canada was bombed in the overnight hours earlier this week. The Toronto-based group that owns it called it a targeted attack. It's not blaming the Israeli military or anyone else, but it does want to know who would bomb a water supply vehicle and why. Our team parked our water tank uh, overnight and the next morning when they came back to it, our water tank was bombed. There was no warnings around exactly, you know, that this was coming or this was going to happen. Um, so it makes our team concerned, it makes us concerned. The group is calling on the Canadian government to investigate who is responsible. Almost one billion people in India are eligible to vote in the country's parliamentary election over the next six weeks. The vote began on Friday, and it is the largest national democratic voting process undertaken in history. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is hoping for a third term in office of the world's largest democracy, but opposition parties are saying the odds have been stacked against them. Redmond Shannon reports. Phase one sealed and stamped, ending the first of seven voting days scheduled over the next six weeks. Staggered logistics because of India's staggering population, almost one billion eligible voters, the largest democratic vote the world has ever seen, in heat that topped 40 degrees in central India on Friday. People are getting dehydrated, but they must show up because voting is even more important than eating, says this woman. Polls suggest current Prime Minister Narendra Modi will win a third term in office. His BJP party and its allies may increase their parliamentary majority. He vows to make India a developed country by its centenary in 2047. But millions still live in extreme poverty and unemployment is stubbornly high. We have so many educated uh, students, educated people, but still we lack employment. The BJP is popular despite those economic concerns and partly because of Modi's Hindu nationalist policies. India's image in the world has gone up. We have a strong leader who has, who has raised the stature of India across the world. So I think these are the issues which are going to be the deciding issues.
a controversial immigration policy and the building of a major Hindu temple on the site of a former mosque have angered many of this secular country's 200 million Muslims. The most prominent face among the opposition alliance is Rahul Gandhi, part of the fourth generation of a political family dynasty. He pledges more help for lower social classes. Gandhi and other Modi opponents say law enforcement agencies have been targeting them and their campaigns. Not least, Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal, who is currently jailed, accused of corruption, charges he denies. The seventh and final voting day is June 1st. Results are expected three days after that. Redmond Channel Global News, London. Allegations of India meddling in Canadian elections. Coming up, why Sikh Canadians believe foreign interference isn't limited to China. A New Brunswick man who spent 40 years trying to clear his name in a murder case has just died, just four months after being declared innocent. I'd just like to thank everybody. And Innocence Canada. The organization Innocence Canada says Walter Gillespie died Friday in his home in St. John. He was 80 years old. Gillespie and his friend Robert Mailman, who had okay, well, terminal he's cancer, he's were wrongfully he's convicted in the 1983 murder of a St. John man. A New Brunswick judge apologized in January for what she called a miscarriage of justice. The inquiry looking into foreign interference in Canada has been heavily focused on the alleged work of Chinese agents here in Canada. But a group of Sikh leaders is also pushing for more attention on another perceived threat, India. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief David Aiken joins us now with what they're asking for. David. Justice Marie-José Hogue is to publish her findings of fact by May the 3rd. And for Canada's sick community, this is a first-of-its-kind opportunity to take judicial notice of election interference by the government of India. India is one of the most uh, uh, prolific and kind of uh, alarming perpetrators of foreign interference and transnational repression in Canada. Governments in India have long been fearful of movements to establish a separate Sikh homeland in its northwest, in the Punjab. As a result, the Indian government, according to Canadian security agencies, interferes in the political activity of the global Sikh diaspora, including in Canada. Part of that is uh, a fear of the Sikh community uh, gaining success in the political space and the political theater and electoral politics and the hallways of power. Sick Canadians are actively engaged at all levels in Canada's politics. Harjit Sajjan is one of several six Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has appointed to his cabinet. Tim Upple is the deputy leader of the Conservative Party. Jagmeet Singh leads Canada's New Democrats and the mayors of both Calgary and Edmonton are sick. The Sikh community has definitely punched above its weight politically. Many of those politicians have been targets of disinformation campaigns believed to be the work of Indian government state actors. Mr. Trudeau. Sikh Coalition Council Prabjot Singh wants Justice Hogue to make a finding that Canadian authorities have not done enough to combat India's interference. And that lack of action set in motion the events which led to the assassination in Surrey, B.C. last year of a Sikh activist. An assassination that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau later said was linked to Indian government actors. So those networks that were engaging on behalf of the Indian state in this country were allowed impunity and con allowed to continue functioning and presumably laid the groundwork for what would be the assassination. of. Now, the Indian Foreign Ministry says all of this is nonsense, that the Indian government does not interfere in Canadian politics, and in fact, it's the Canadian government that interferes in Indian politics. Well, both countries may now look to a Canadian jurist, that's Justice Og, when she delivers her findings of fact into allegations of Indian interference. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. Ahead, grim anniversary, 25 years since Columbine, and the number of school shootings keeps rising. A chemical plant in Sarnia is temporarily shutting down, only days after high levels of the cancer-causing chemical benzene 
were detected nearby. In an email, Ineo Styrolution said it is shutting down to perform maintenance. Dozens of people in the First Nation of Amjanong, which is located right across the street from the plant, reported feeling unwell. Some of them even went to hospital. The company says ensuring the health and safety of our employees and community is paramount. 25 years after two senior students entered Colorado's Columbine High School and opened fire, killing a teacher and 12 fellow students, there are still so many lessons to take away from that tragedy. At the time, that kind of violence at a school was unthinkable. But Columbine wasn't America's first mass shooting, nor would it be the last. Since Columbine in April 1999, there have been more than 400 school shootings across the United States. As Karen Lieberman reports, U.S. lawmakers have struggled to roll out the type of firearms legislation that could help prevent gun violence. Their images no one can forget. The stories of April 20th, 1999, seared into the minds of survivors. I just started screaming and crying and telling them not to shoot me. The day two teenage boys went on a killing rampage at Columbine High School in suburban Denver, before taking their own lives. We don't do something about this gun show loophole. We're going to continue to have serious, serious problems. For decades, American presidents have vowed to find a way. We're going to have to come together and take meaningful action to prevent more tragedies like this, regardless of the politics. It's been going on too long, too many instances, and we're going to get it done. I have on the full extent of my executive authority to do on my own anything about guns. And yet 25 years later. 25 years later, this just keeps happening, even though 25 years ago, collectively as a nation, we screamed never again. Since Columbine, at least 415 people have been killed in school shootings in the U.S., according to the Gun Violence Archive. Earlier this month, the Biden administration approved the largest expansion of background checks for gun purchases in years. Addressing the very loophole that allowed the Columbine shooters to obtain their weapons. Under President Biden's leadership, we are taking action. But we need Congress to finish the job. At a vigil in Denver, a Columbine survivor, whose sister was paralyzed from the shooting and mother died by suicide a few months after, with a message about the lasting effects of school violence. These things come in waves, and they can hit you when you least expect it. But you should all know that we're all here for you. A reminder that the trauma of such a tragedy remains today, even as politicians struggle to find ways to stop it from happening again. Karen Lieberman, Global News, Toronto. Next, Canada's Cup hopes. Can one of four Canadian clubs break the curse and secure hockey's ultimate prize? Some hockey history in the making today. A PWHL game between Toronto and Montreal once again smashed the all-time attendance record for a women's hockey game. The two teams played in front of a sold-out crowd of 21,105 fans at the Bell Centre in Montreal today. Now, that is the largest attendance ever recorded for a women's hockey game anywhere in the world. Toronto went on to win in overtime, becoming the first team in the league to clinch a spot in the playoffs. The game played between the same teams at the Scotiabank Arena in February set previous attendance records of a little over 19,000 fans. Now to the big question on most Canadian minds. Will a Canadian team win this season's Stanley Cup? The last time a Canadian team carved up was some 31 years ago. Tonight, Eric Sorensen on whether one of our own can break the curse. Could this finally be the year? After a slow start by the Oilers, that playoff feeling's back in Edmonton. This city changes. Absolutely, it changes. People book their schedules around when the Oilers games are going to happen. In Vancouver, restaurants are counting on fans coming out. People want to be with people to support their team. In Toronto, no less an authority than this former star is confident. Clean slate, and I know the team will be ready and uh, the best times right now. Every team in the West has had its issues, and mm -hmm. the Jets are no different. And on this Winnipeg radio program, there is excitement about, well, who else? 
The Jets are the fourth overall team in the National Hockey League. I don't think anybody saw that coming. In fact, all four Canadian playoff teams finished with more than 100 points. It feels a little like the old days when Canada produced generations of NHL champions. The last Stanley Cup won by a Canadian team was the Montreal Canadiens in 1993. In the 30 years since, American teams have taken every cup. 15 U.S. franchises have won, while Canada's been shut out. In the three decades before, Canadian teams were in command. The Maple Leafs in the 60s, Montreal dominated the 70s, the Edmonton Oilers won five cups after that, and Calgary got one too. 21 Stanley Cups in 30 years. The Oilers against the Kings for the third straight year. Uh, Suffice it to say, this country is overdue. And this longtime superfan has high hopes for Edmonton. I think McDavid, Dreisaitl, and the stars they have are good enough. And Winnipeg. Winnipeg can. Connor Hellebuck's the best goalie in the National Hockey League. And Vancouver. You've got these star players that had a fantastic first half. The Canucks need to rediscover what was working for them in the first half. And then there's Toronto. A lot of it's, it feels like has been they get into that, that Game 7 pressure cooker and they fold. But if the Leafs can get over that hurdle by beating the Bruins... None of those Canadian teams where they're just like, hey, we're happy to be here. Uh, these teams have uh, championship aspirations. Now the playoffs are beginning and hope springs eternal, even for long-suffering Canadian hockey fans. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Oh, fingers crossed. All right, that's Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Farah Nasser, and on behalf of our whole crew here, I want to thank you so much for spending part of your Saturday evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is Grouse Mountain in BC, where its resident grizzly bears have emerged from hibernation. It was the 23rd hibernation for Grinder and Kula at the mountain's wildlife refuge. Both were found as orphans in the wilderness back in 2001. They both lost 180 pounds in the last few months, but considering they began hibernating at 1,000 pounds each, they'll be just fine. Until next time, take care of yourselves and each other. Have a good night.